Hey everyone, welcome to the Ethereum Basics live stream. We're going to go live in just a few minutes. But first, uh, a few messages from our sponsors. You know, no, I'm just kidding. Who are our sponsors? You are. And I want to extend a thank you to all of the people who make it possible for me to do these ad-free, um, free content pieces, these live streams, my videos, my educational work. Um, and those people are my community builders who donate a monthly subscription on Patreon, here on YouTube with YouTube memberships, and make it possible for me to do this work and to support not just me, but uh, most importantly, my staff who helped me get this work done. Uh, so I'm going to thank some of those people now, and uh, we're going to get started in just about four minutes. Hang out for a second. I am a patron of Andreas because I came across his videos online and that's how I learned about Bitcoin, so that's how I got introduced to Bitcoin. I'm out tonight um, at a social event organized by Andreas as part of his uh, Patreon support. Um, we just uh, had a few drinks in a pub, uh, which is a punch tavern uh, downtown London, so it's been a really fun evening uh, to meet a lot of my mind. We should support the work Andreas is doing. He's doing so much in getting new people into Bitcoin and into Bitcoin education. He's a great teacher. He can explain very complex topics in an easy to understand way. He's very honest, very precise, technically prepared and intellectually honest. I think it's uh, his best characteristic. Bring such clarity to uh, really complex subjects, uh, which is Bitcoin and um, the industry around it has been a very, very good inspiration for me. And every Bitcoin I'm giving to him, it will be very well used in helping others understand Bitcoin. And I think it will improve the world at some point. Being a patron, I get to meet Andreas. And that's why, why I love being a patron. I'm going to continue being a patron. I think it's just a good thing. If you're interested in learning new things, and also want to support the, the Bitcoin community, then you got to be a patron. Being a Patreon makes you feel special. You can uh, attend to his uh, live Q&A sessions. You can meet him at happy hours. It's really great, totally worth it. I'm very, very enthusiastic of being a Patreon. I'd like him to be able to produce his great and valuable content in the future free from advertising and just with the help of his Patreons, and that's why I'm supporting him on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free, so if you want to support it, join me on Patreon.
intro, take two. And now we're back, and this time we actually have sound. Welcome everyone to my uh, Ethereum Basics bonus live stream. And I'm sorry about that little technical glitch. Um, I had my microphone muted, so there you go. Uh, I will promptly uh, fire my audio engineer. Um, unfortunately for you, I am my audio engineer. So if I did fire myself, then we wouldn't have a live stream. So I'd better rehire myself right away and continue with the program. Thank you for your patience. Sorry for the technical mistake. And thank you to all of those who support me with a monthly subscription on Patreon or with YouTube memberships where you get some cute little emojis. Um, your support makes it possible for me to do this work. Um, and to continue an, a mission to educate people about Bitcoin and open blockchains. Today we're talking about Ethereum, uh, which is one of the open blockchains that I'm very interested in, and uh, we'll take your basics questions. This content is brought to you free, as well as ad-free, uh, and that's only possible because uh, my staff and I are supported with your monthly recurring donations, and I really appreciate it. Another little announcement, we just passed 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. 200,000 subscribers. And to think, I started this channel simply because I wanted somewhere to link uh, in a playlist my various talks that I'd given at conferences because they were all over the place. And I just wanted to keep a little catalog. I mean, who's going to watch that anyway? Well, 200,000 of you are not only watching, but subscribing. And if you've turned on notifications, you get notified every time um, I post a new video. We've got 250 people watching live now. Again, thank you for coming today to this Ethereum Basics. We'll get started in just a second. I want to quickly remind you of our moderation policy. Today is a bonus live stream specifically about Ethereum Basics, and I want everyone to please stay on topic. Also, in order to ask a question, you have to go on slido.com and use A Antonop ETH Basics as the code. My moderators are going to post that in the chat in just a second, uh, just to help you remind, uh, just to help remind you what that code is. Now you can use that to go on Slido and ask a question. Here's the trick, however. I'm only going to get ch a chance to answer about a dozen questions today. And so if you have a burning question before you post it, make sure someone hasn't already asked it. Um, perhaps slight variation of what you want to ask, but close enough. Uh, remember that if you post another copy of that question, a slight variation, you'll end up splitting the votes, which means both your question and the one that's close enough are less likely to get answered. Uh, if instead you vote for the one that's close enough, you have a much better chance of having it answered. So uh, that's a little um, insight into voting strategies. Uh, <laughs> and you might play those games a bit on Slido. And uh, of course, just because a question is voted doesn't mean I answer it because I am the benevolent dictator of this bonus live stream. So I get to pick the questions that I find the most interesting. Your votes obviously help me see those. Great, um, 275 people joined, and it's time to start with our first question. Let's see if it pops up correctly. And it did. Actually, it didn't, because that's the first question I want to answer today. Anonymous asks, well, one second. Let me switch my screen here, just so I can see the question more clearly. Um, Anonymous asks, how does Bitcoin and Ethereum relate to each other? Do they complement each other? Now, today, as we're doing this live stream, a Twitter war is raging about the relative merits of these two blockchains. And accusations are being hurled from either side uh, in this um, bitter debate. Uh, and you probably know that I have worked for eight years in the Bitcoin space, but I've also worked in the Ethereum space since the very, very beginning of Ethereum. In fact, slightly before the beginning of Ethereum. And I've published one book on uh, Bitcoin, Mastering Bitcoin, and one book on Mastering Ethereum. So why am I interested in both? 
The reason I'm interested in both is because I think they solve different problems. And I think both systems have uh, technology that is fascinating and they have their own merits. And I do not recommend investment or discuss investment or price in either system. You will not hear me recommending investment in Ethereum. You will not hear me recommending investment in Bitcoin. Why? Because I'm not an investment advisor. I'm a technologist. I'm interested in technology, whether you like it as an investment or not. And so how do Bitcoin and Ethereum relate to each other? Well, they're pursuing different goals. They're making different choices on some important uh, and fundamental trade-offs that exist in the technology of open blockchains. Trade-offs between scaling, security, um, flexibility, robustness, and things like that. Uh, these trade-offs uh, ultimately result in the two systems pursuing different technological paths to fulfill different application needs and use cases. And if you want to learn more about how I see this distinction, probably the most important talk I've done in this particular case is called The Lion and the Shark. And it describes these two systems as two apex predators that are operating in completely different environments and therefore do not compete directly. In fact, I see them as having very synergistic roles where they complement each other. Um, Ethereum allows a lot of experimentation and the expression of complex smart contracts, which we neither want nor can implement in Bitcoin. Bitcoin implements robust uh, censorship resistant, very hard money, uh, which we neither want nor can implement in Ethereum. And so comparing them on the basis of characteristics that are fundamentally different is unfair to both. It is no more useful to compare Ethereum on its monetary policy as it is to compare Bitcoin on the speed of its transactions, for example. And so as a result, I look at these systems as serving different needs very useful in their respective cases and also complementary in many ways. And that has nothing to do with their investment potential. Let's see what else we're going to answer. Um, hopefully that put to rest some of the debates that are raging because I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I don't want to get into it and I don't think there's any value in debating um, whether um, a Ferrari or an agricultural tractor are better um, as vehicles because it depends what you want to use them for. Um, and for that reason, I'm not going to get into it. If you do decide to get into it in our chat, you will quickly discover what a timeout is. And that's where you get to stand in the corner, facing the corner for 360 seconds while you calm down um, because that's a waste of everybody's attention. Moderators, arm your timeouts. All right, let's move on. Our next question comes from our friend, yes to crypto. He was one of the people I thanked in the initial slides. Um, and thank you again, yes to crypto, uh, both for your support and for this great question. Yes to crypto asks, I've heard the phrase, if Bitcoin is like gold, then Litecoin is like silver and Ethereum is like oil. How would you rate and or modify this summary statement? Um, I think that while the sentiment behind this statement is interesting, it doesn't really give us a very good model for understanding any of these technologies or their impact on the world. I think um, these are fun slogans, perhaps, but I don't think they give us any underlying insight. Analogies, uh, metaphors, stories, narratives have a purpose, and that purpose is to cast light, to reveal some underlying truth, um, to help simplify or understand a complex topic. But if you choose the wrong analogy, uh, then you're not casting light. You're not uh, demystifying or clarifying the underlying con concept, uh, but instead you're just clouding the waters. Uh, so the if Bitcoin is gold, Litecoin is silver, Ethereum is like oil, uh, is fundamentally broken in a number of different ways. First of all, all three of these are commodities. Um, and um, I, I don't really see any of these three platforms as purely commodities. In fact, I think uh, looking at them as commodities 
from a marketplace perspective only misses uh, some of their fundamental characteristics. All three of these things are programmable um, to different degrees. And their programmability is one of the many things that makes them incredibly interesting, probably one of the main things that makes them incredibly interesting. And of course, commodities are not programmable. Commodities just sit there to be extracted. Um, perhaps from a monetary perspective, if you look at the monetary policy of the different uh, systems, then this could be an apt analogy. But to reduce um, these three blockchains simply to their monetary characteristics is also uh, an unnecessary and um, confusing reduction. So I don't really like this summary statement. Uh, I don't think it expresses the comparison between these three blockchains. All right, let me see uh, how things are going in the chat, um, whether we are um, experiencing a dumpster fire yet or not. I, I see we've got some all caps screaming. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be a fun one today. I really did pick my day very, very well. All right, let's, uh, <laughs> yes, please, emoji storm. That's what we need right now, an emoji storm. Thank you. Next question comes from Anonymous. Uh, can you please explain gas and what is happening around back running in DeFi applications as well as EIP-1559 that contemplates fee burns in Ethereum 2.0? Um, gas is Ethereum's way of metering the use of the blockchain. It's very different from transaction fees in Bitcoin, although it does serve some of that role. Um, gas instead is actually related to resolving the Turing completeness aspect of Ethereum, which I have quite a few questions on the board here that I'll be answering. So Turing completeness is a characteristic of Ethereum where um, theoretically, well, no, very practically, you can write an Ethereum program that loops forever. And um, that is the main characteristic of a programming language um, that is Turing complete, a computing system that is Turing complete. It can have infinite loops. So gas is used to meter that, to ensure that you don't have denial of service attacks or infinite loops. Uh, that consume everybody's resources because in validating an Ethereum smart contract, you never know how long it will run. So you need some kind of metering and accounting system, and that's what gas is. Um, gas also serves the role of a transaction fee. And similar to Bitcoin, until recently, um, well, for all of Ethereum's life so far, gas is used as a transaction fee in a very similar way um, by holding an auction where people bid for block space by setting their transaction fee in gas and miners pick the transactions or um, Ethereum transactions uh, based on the highest amount of gas. As a result, um, as a result, um, there is competition and that has led to some side effects very much like it has in Bitcoin, which is that People tend to overpay for gas. Uh, it's very difficult to predict what gas requirements or gas costs will be in the next block, just like it is difficult to calculate how much of a transaction fee per byte you need to pay in Bitcoin to get into the next block, um, because you're dealing with a competition with other bidders. So when you bid, you change the future. Um, and as others are bidding, they're changing your future in this auction system. Same thing happens here, uh, which results in bidding wars, which can drive up the price of gas. We've seen deviations of up to a factor of 200, meaning that um, for the same space in the same block, you can have volatility in the gas price by a factor of 200 or more, uh, similar to a transaction fee spike in Bitcoin. 
So uh, that's what gas does today. Interestingly enough, one of the proposals mentioned here, EIP 1559 changes that equation. Instead of having a variable auction for gas, um, it changes the way gas is used so that you have a base fee of gas in every block and then a slight premium on top of that that users can adjust to prioritize their transaction. And what's interesting here is that the base fee remains relatively constant, um, but the block size is adjusted dynamically. So um, if you think about it, if the block size is static and the fee you pay for gas is dynamic, that means that you have a bidding war for gas price. Um, if you keep the base fee static and you vary the block dynamically, um, it's almost like the difficulty adjustment in Bitcoin. So it can move within a certain range, but it damps down on volatility. This is intended to reduce the volatility of gas. And one of the interesting parts of the EIP-1559 proposal is that the base fee is burned. It isn't given to miners. What miners get are, is only the premium, the um, increase over the base fee that people are willing to pay, which itself is capped. Uh, and this is intended to reduce volatility, but it also has another very interesting side effect. And that is that it reduces the inflation rate or the supply rate of ether um, by creating a counter force that burns ether in every block um, and um, reduces its available liquid supply. So that's what 1559 is. A lot of changes are happening in Ethereum right now in the run-up to Ethereum 2.0. And many of these changes are exploring some very interesting models for both fees as well as scaling in the Ethereum ecosystem. All right, so I'm gonna take a few second break here, drink some coffee, look at what's happening in our chat room. Um, uh, I may have to put on a gas mask to go in there. And in the meantime, you can enjoy the moderation policy. And there we go. Um, yes, the crypto was the only one in the chat to pick up on my ridiculously terrible dad joke level pun of putting on a gas mask after I just discussed gas prices in Ethereum. Yes, yes, it was very bad. All right. Annabelle asks, might you explain to my mom what does Turing complete mean in practical terms? Um, by the way, just in case there's any confusion, that's Turing complete, which is spelled T-U-R-I-N-G. And um, Turing was the name of Alan Turing, also known as the father of computer science, a computer scientist who lived in the 60s um, who died in the 60s in uh, England and who was behind the allied effort to crack the Nazis' cryptographic systems and created the theoretical foundation for computer science. Uh, Turing has left us with a couple of very, very important concepts, including the first programmable computers and how to think about those theoretically. Um, the Turing theorem uh, which describes how computing machines relate to each other and what their capabilities are. Um, the Turing uh, incompleteness problem, uh, which is the fact that 
um, you cannot predict with a computer whether a computer program will terminate, uh, will stop running, and when it will stop running, because it might run forever. And the Turing test, which you may have heard of, which is a theoretical test to tell the difference between an artificial intelligence and a human. Um, Alan Turing is one of the most influential people in computer science, uh, who was murdered by the British government um, because he was gay and to their great shame after saving us from the Nazis. Now, what does Turing complete mean in practical terms? Um, Turing complete means in practical terms that um, a language that is capable of looping, uh, and looping is when in a program you either can uh, go back to an earlier state and repeat some function, or you uh, repeat some function based on some criterion. Like for example, if the number is less than five, keep going. If it's more than five, stop and go back and do it again and again and again until something changes. Any language, fundamentally, that is capable of doing this, that is capable of looping, um, has the possibility of an infinite loop, a loop that never ends. Why? Because the number never goes over five. Um, it might, it might not. And it's not possible to predict if the loop will end. And the reason for that is because the loop, of course, is influenced by the internal state of the program. And even if you were to simulate the internal state of a program on another computer, uh, that other computer would also not finish running the simulation of the first computer, which means that it's impossible to predict with a computer whether another program will finish or not, or whether it will run forever. Now, this is a fundamental um, theoretical foundation for computer science, um, and it also gives us a very important insight into how we write the scripting language that is used inside a blockchain. Ethereum is Turing complete, which means that it can loop. Bitcoin script is Turing incomplete, which means that it cannot loop. That means that you can make certain predictions about Bitcoin script, such as the fact that it will run for a certain number of steps and then it will end, um, and it cannot run indefinitely. You cannot make these predictions for an Ethereum smart contract. It might try to en uh, run indefinitely. And in order to prevent that, there is a system of accounting, a metering system. Think of it like a taxi meter. You get into running an Ethereum smart contract and it has a certain amount of gas that it's willing to spend. Every little function that it runs, every command that it runs in the Ethereum virtual machine costs a certain amount of gas. And that cost is deducted from the smart contract's uh, gas account until either the program finishes before running out of gas or it runs out of gas and terminates with an error. Uh, this ensures that all Ethereum smart contracts will either finish running within their allocated budget or they will be stopped by the Ethereum virtual machine, which means that you can validate Ethereum smart contracts on your computer without the danger of your computer running forever trying to validate a single smart contract. And of course, this is necessary in order to prevent denial of service. Now, you might think at this point, is, it, is Turing completeness a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create very, very simple programs that are guaranteed in their length of execution, then Turing completeness is a bad thing and you don't want it. In fact, it's actually difficult to make a language Turing incomplete. It's fairly easy to become accidentally Turing complete. And there are a whole history of computer languages that were considered or thought to be Turing incomplete, including HTML and CSS, and were later found accidentally, oopsie, to become Turing complete and therefore have the possibility of looping and infinite runtimes. So making something Turing complete, very easy. Keeping it Turing incomplete, quite difficult. And you have to keep the language very simple and avoid certain scenarios. But if a language is Turing complete, that means you can express very, very complex programs. In fact, what Turing proved with his Turing theorem is that any program 
that you can imagine, no matter what computer you use, if you run it on a Turing complete system, it can be expressed. Meaning that a Turing complete system can simulate any computing system that is based on a simple set of programmable instructions. So if you have a Turing complete smart contract language, you can do everything. And this is critical um, because that means you have enormous flexibility and expression. Now, I don't know if that explained it for your mom, Annabelle, but hey, Annabelle's mom, I hope that helped. It is a very confusing topic. And by the way, this isn't simple stuff. This is computer science 101, but it is college level computer science. And it takes quite a bit of mathematics and uh, quite a bit of study to understand these topics. So don't worry if you didn't get it the first time. Watch this video again. Let's see what else we have here. Ah, oh, there we go. I'm having some difficulty scrolling here. Whoops. All right, are we having fun? I hope we are. TigerX asks, what are the challenges of sharding and proof of stake and how does it actually work? So many of you have probably heard that um, Ethereum is transitioning to a new consensus model. And this is being done for two reasons. The first reason is that Ethereum was always intended to be a proof of stake system and proof of work was always intended to be temporary. However, the transition to proof of stake was delayed significantly as the research and um, understanding of proof of stake developed enormously during the time that Ethereum was growing. And so as a result, uh, now Ethereum is moving towards proof of stake in a very, very specific manner um, and an almost irreversible manner and moving away from proof of work. So this was always part of the plan. Another aspect of it, however, was scaling or is scaling. Like any other open blockchain, Ethereum has to make some fundamental trade-offs between security, robustness, decentralization, uh, performance, uh, scaling, you know, all of these different properties. And it's easy to scale if you sacrifice decentralization. It's much more difficult to scale if you want decentralization, security, and scaling. And so um, what Ethereum is doing in order to attempt to solve that is a, a technique called sharding. If you've ever worked in databases, you've probably heard of the concept of sharding. In a database system, sharding is when the database is partitioned into multiple segments called shards and um, an algorithm is used to keep them synchronized so that the data is consistent between the various shards. This technique is also used in distributed systems, in a variety of distributed systems. Um, for example, it's used to uh, segment the table of files and file contents on a uh, distributed file sharing system like BitTorrent. In that case, the sharding is done using what's known as a decentralized hash table, or is it a distributed hash table, a DHT? The general idea with sharding is that rather than everybody validating everything, instead um, you split the overall space into 64, for example, different shards, and each shard is validated independently, and then the results are merged together. This gives a blockchain a degree of parallelization, at least that's the theory. And um, the idea here being that instead of having uh, one block uh, in every time period, you can have 64 blocks being validated simultaneously, one per shard, and then you have these blocks um, essentially coordinated into a coordination chain called the beacon chain. And the beacon chain acts as the point where all of the different shards converge to ensure one consistent state across all shards. There are a number of difficult problems to solve in this concept, but 
sharding and proof of stake go hand in hand because the development of these technologies was done at the same time in order to make this transition um, uh, more consistent uh, with the strategy, mission, ethos of uh, Ethereum. So what happened was that initially these two were going to be uh, implemented separately, proof of stake first, then later sharding. But in the end, it was decided to do a clean slate design, which is now called Ethereum 2.0. Ethereum 2.0 is the simultaneous implementation of sharding and proof of stake in a three phase transition. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more uh, in some of the follow up questions. Um, so we'll get back to exactly how Ethereum 2.0 will play out. So there are a number of challenges with sharding and a number of challenges um, with proof of stake. But I don't think these are insurmountable challenges, they're engineering challenges. And in fact, we have some very good solutions being proposed that have now had more than two years of research and testing and are being implemented right now in Ethereum 2.0. Um, proof of stake's uh, problem is balancing um, subjectivity and finality with a mechanism that ensures that you don't have a problem called nothing at stake. Meaning that in proof of stake, uh, instead of uh, miners um, using energy in order, to, um, in order to bet on a specific block and validate it, instead you have validators who put down an amount of ether into a smart contract and then vote for the validation of a specific block. Um, there are a couple of problems there. One of them is called the nothing at stake problem, which is when if um, validators can vote on multiple blocks simultaneously, then they just vote yes on everything. And if there's nothing to lose because the blocks that don't get validated um, don't have any downside, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. So um, to solve that, there is a technique called slashing. And what slashing does is it ensures that if you um, vote for a block that ends up being invalid, you get penalized. And even the blocks that don't get validated um, get merged into the consensus algorithm so that you do get penalized. The reward for voting for a valid block is less than the penalty for voting for an invalid block, heavily favoring the incentives towards correct validation of transactions and blocks. And that's the mechanism that's being used today. It's a mechanism called Casper, uh, the friendly finality ghost, which is a hybrid proof of stake and proof of work, which is going to be followed by Casper, correct by construction, as far as I understand it, um, which is um, a pure proof of stake system. Today, these concepts are being tested out in phase zero of uh, Ethereum 2.0, which launched on August 4th. It is a test network that's estimated to run for about a year, which involves um, validation of Ethereum 1's proof of work blocks, but in a test net with validators um, providing test Ethernet in order to prove the concept. Enough about that. Let's uh, see if there are any more follow-up questions on this topic. And we're going to be having uh, more discussion about this topic, I think, in other questions. Breaking news. Annabelle's mom understood the explanation. Thank you. All right. Kevin asks, when running an Ethereum full node, how can one verify the total supply of Ether on the network? Is this costly compared to get TX out set info on Bitcoin CLI? Um, this question is part technology, part doctrine. Um, and I'm going to answer it very carefully because this question is at the core of the raging debate that's happening right now on Twitter about whether Ethereum um, has any discernible maximum limit on its supply. And I'm not going to go down that particular rabbit hole. Um, the bottom line here is that the structure of Ethereum is fundamentally different from that of Bitcoin. 
In Bitcoin, all amounts are held in what are known as unspent transaction outputs. These are UTXO. The TX out in the get TX out set info uh, command that Kevin refers to. Transaction outputs um, are basically small chunks of Bitcoin uh, whose ownership changes and that can get merged and split uh, based on a transaction. And that is very different from how Ethereum works. Ethereum uses account balances, and these account balances are um, updated through state transitions of the Ethereum virtual machine um, from block to block. And this state, in order to calculate the total amount of ether that is in circulation or is stored in addresses, what you have to do is you have to play the entire blockchain from the beginning in order to validate that the current balances that are being held um, are correct. And because this state is spread across many, 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 many blocks, and because some of those blocks were subject to denial of service attacks that make that validation very, very time consuming, um, it is actually difficult to figure out the exact and precise amount of Ethereum that is currently in supply in the accounts. There is an upper bound, of course. You can count the issuance. Um, but that's not the same as looking at what Ethereum is in balances. And so, yeah, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, but then again, that's not a very good question to ask in the first place. And this is the objection I have to the debate that's going on at the moment. This is a gotcha question. This is a question where you're asking Ethereum to be measured by the monetary characteristics of Bitcoin. And that is exactly as fair as asking, how fast can a turtle fly? Um, and the answer is, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but, or how fast can a bird swim? The bottom line is that uh, monetary characteristics are not the primary criteria of interest in the Ethereum space. And the reason they're not the primary uh, characteristic of interest in the Ethereum space is because Ether is not money. Ether is a mechanism for paying for gas, which is a mechanism for metering during complete smart contracts, which are mechanisms for expressing rich applications in a composable system. And to measure Ethereum based on its monetary policy is to fundamentally misunderstand its purpose. Again, as I said before, that's a bit like asking how many transactions per second can you do on Bitcoin and then going ha ha at the answer which is too low. Um, that's not the fundamental purpose of Bitcoin. So um, before you go asking this question, understand why it's being asked and what kind of frame it's trying to put Ethereum into. I don't think the answer is that interesting. The bottom line is that the monetary policy of Ethereum is very different from that of Bitcoin. Whether you decide you like Austrian economics or not, um, that is a completely separate question as to whether Ethereum has merit or whether it works for its intended purpose. All right. Have we set the dumpster fire in the chat on fire now? All right, so the current debate is Ether is money. Ether isn't money. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Why are you punching me? I'm not punching you. Take your hand off my face. Take your face off my hand. I don't think that's a very useful debate, but it is a lot of fun for my moderators who are going to get a hazard pay bonus overpay. All right. Anonymous asks, which Ethereum two, layer two protocols are you most excited about? Um, 
I am familiar only with the broad outlines of the variety of layer two protocols. It's very difficult to exactly describe what is and what isn't a layer two protocol in Ethereum, because there are a number of ways that you can do the things that we do with Lightning. Same thing applies to uh, Bitcoin, by the way, and that's because Lightning can be described as a ser series of uh, two-person side chains, which are called payment channels. So Lightning is a bit of a side chain, it's a layer two, and are side chains layer twos or not? It's very difficult to draw clear lines. Um, in Ethereum, there are a number of protocols that are used for scaling transactions. Um, the ones I've heard of and I know very little about are Plasma, which I understand to be the closest to Lightning, Raiden, which I think is relatively similar, um, Opportunistic Rollup, which is a scaling technique that isn't um, a layer two exactly or a side chain exactly, and uh, which I honestly don't exactly understand. Um, and of course, sharding, um, which is a scaling solution which has to do with the deployment of multiple side chains of Ethereum operating in parallel, which isn't really a layer two, but it is because all of these things validate down to a beacon chain. Um, so it's kind of like a layer two. In any case, um, there's a lot going on in the particular domain of resolving scaling trade-offs in Ethereum. Actually, a lot more than's going on in Bitcoin in the corresponding domain. In Bitcoin, most of that debate has focused on uh, two competing solutions. One is bigger blocks and the other one is lightning. And that's pretty good because the focus helps um, clarify intentions and people are doing research in a more cohesive way. Ethereum, because of its fundamental ethos of experimentation, has branched off into a hundred different directions, all of which are getting quite substantial development uh, effort. Um, but it's not clear yet which of these solutions are going to prevail or whether it's going to be one solution or even a collection of different solutions all working simultaneously um, in the Ethereum space. So which ones am I most excited about? I'm most excited about the fact that I can't even count them all. Our next question comes from Anonymous. How does memory on Ethereum work? Where is it stored and how is it retrieved? It's a great uh, question. So uh, just like in a um, classical computer, um, the same in Ethereum, there are um, there is um, data that is used purely for storage. And there's also data that is used for storage of the code itself. So um, both the code itself, the smart contracts, the commands, uh, if you like, the byte code of the smart contract, and the associated variables, the permanent storage of the execution, the state, um, state transitions, events, and other things that are created by the execution of the code are all stored as data. And this data is stored um, in the blockchain. And it's stored in the blockchain for a fee. Um, that data, in order to write that data, you have to pay a fee in gas. And in order to retrieve or read that data, you have to pay a fee in gas. And in fact, that's one of the main contributors to gas costs for a smart contract. When writing a smart contract in Ethereum, you have to be very, very careful about um, how exactly you use data. Um, you have to be very efficient in your use of data because you pay for all of it. It's a metered utility computing system. Um, because in order to store and retrieve data, you are imposing a burden on everybody who is keeping an archival copy of the Ethereum blockchain and also on everybody who is validating your smart contract to decide whether its latest execution should be included in the next block as the transaction that you use to execute it and whether its state update should be included in the next block. 
So if you think about it, a smart contract doesn't just run whenever. Uh, in Ethereum, a smart contract runs when a transaction causes it to run. The input is the transaction, the execution is the smart contract, and the output is the changes that that smart contract creates in its data. Um, these are changes both in state, so variables being updated, um, as well as um, events that are being emitted. Think of these as log messages, if you like. Um, as a result, uh, part of the cost of running a transaction is the cost of executing all of these data changes. Um, and a transaction is only valid if it has sufficient gas to pay for its execution. Um, and because smart contracts can call other smart contracts, which can call other smart contracts, when you start running a transaction, you don't know how many smart contracts it's going to call. Um, you don't know how long it's going to run. You don't know how much memory it's going to use. Here's a really interesting thing, though. Um, there is a very interesting little wrinkle in Ethereum, which is that if you release data, if you erase data, you earn back gas. Um, and this was a change that I believe happened uh, not in the beginning of uh, Ethereum, but uh, somewhat later, which was to create a credit for gas. Uh, and I, may, I might be wrong about this. Um, I, I believe that this is currently operating in Ethereum, but I'm not entirely sure because I haven't used it myself and I haven't tested this in a contract. Um, but from what I understand, if you allocate data in the blockchain, you pay gas. But if you release data by erasing it, you earn gas back. And using that little trick, um, some systems have created essentially gas futures, where um, what you do is you buy yourself gas um, during a time when gas prices are low. And um, you do that by effectively paying gas to allocate a whole bunch of data, uh, which is filled with nothing, with randomness, with zeros. I don't know what it's filled with. But in any case, um, you basically grab a lot of data and you pay for it. Then when you want to run a contract later when gas prices are high, you call the smart contract that allocated the data for you and you delete this junk data, getting a gas credit when gas prices are much higher, which allows you to reduce your gas cost. Brilliant, right? Um, that little wrinkle in the accounting was actually used to build an entire infrastructure for a secondary market for gas futures. Um, it's one of the fascinating details uh, that really makes me interested in Ethereum because these little secondary effects and secondary markets that emerge from the composability of the underlying system um, are fascinating. All right, just a quick break here. Let's see how many uh, people we have. And uh, I don't know, do you, wanna, do you wanna see the moderation policy again? I don't know, do you really need to see that? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put up a thank you for my patrons since I need to take a, a sip of water while you're watching this. All right, and we're back. I'm actually going to run this live stream long because we have some great questions and I'm not done. Um, I have quite a few things on my mind and I want to talk about them a bit more. So um, let's answer one more question and then we'll do a special segment called Down the Rabbit Hole. So I hope you enjoy that. But first, let's go to the question by Mr. Dense. 
I see the term Ethereum killer thrown around a lot. Do you think there will be an Ethereum killer or instead an ecosystem of coexisting blockchains? I'm so glad you asked, Mr. Dents. Um, I think the term Ethereum killer makes as much sense as the term Bitcoin killer or the next Bitcoin. And I did a talk about this called Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. And everybody in Bitcoin cheered until halfway through the video. I said, and also Ethereum is the next Ethereum. And everyone went because they didn't want to hear that. Bottom line is that when a system uh, captures enough market share, enough developer mind share, and does the job well enough, it is almost impossible to unseat that with minor incremental changes. It requires a truly revolutionary change. And of course, all of the Ethereum killers, just like all the Bitcoin killers before them will say, we have that truly revolutionary change. Uh, no, you don't. It's not that easy. Um, and as a result, especially with Ethereum that has the flexibility and the ethos to move very fast, break things if necessary, and implement new and exciting features all the time, sometimes incredibly dangerous and buggy features too, um, this creates an environment where it's even harder to kill Ethereum with an Ethereum killer than it is to kill Bitcoin with, an, with a Bitcoin killer, which I also think is not possible. So, um, no, um, I don't believe in Ethereum killers. And the reason I don't believe in Ethereum killers is because I think Ethereum can continue to evolve, improve, uh, and iterate, and in fact, very fast, absorb features that are good enough, but deploy them on a platform with a much bigger installed base, with much better and uh, better maintained libraries, infrastructure support, developer, uh, Mindshare and all of the other things that make a platform great. And uh, so I don't think all of these me too second um, comer blockchains are going to have much success in this space. If they differentiate enough to be really interesting, they're no longer competing with Ethereum. And if they don't differentiate enough to be really interesting, well, they're not really interesting. All right. Let's see. It's time. For Down the Rabbit Hole, which is the special segment where I ask myself the question that I wanted to ask myself, but you failed to ask, so I get to ask it instead and then answer it and pretend like it's an original question that nobody ever thought of before because I asked it. Great question, Andreas. <laughs> All right, so um, what is Ethereum 2.0? When is it happening? Is it real? And what should I expect? Now, you asked similar questions, but I wanted to phrase it in that particular way. And great question, Andreas. What is Ethereum 2.0? Ethereum 2.0 is a clean slate design of Ethereum intended to replace Ethereum um, in a state transition that will occur approximately one to two years from now. Um, this represents a transition of Ethereum from a proof of work system to a proof of stake system and also from a single chain system to a sharded chain system of 64 parallel executing chains which are converged on a coordination chain called the beacon chain. The beacon chain itself uh, is a chain that doesn't actually store any of the transactions or data. Instead, the beacon chain is the basis for the proof of stake system. It keeps track of the proof of stake validators. Validators are those who commit 32 ether, uh, and that is the minimum commit you can make to become a validator, and then validate blocks. If they validate them correctly, they get rewarded. Uh, with a percentage return of between 2% and up to possibly 18% per annum on their underlying stake. If, on the other hand, they validate an incorrect block, they get severely penalized, uh, in some cases losing up to 100% of their staked amount. 
Um, although I believe in the first implementation, it's not that harsh, but it's certainly a lot worse than the reward. Uh, heavily incentivizing people to validate correctly. Validators also get penalized if, when called to validate a block, they are not online. So being online continuously is a requirement to be a validator. If a validator gets penalized several times as they lose stake, they reach a point where their stake drops below 16 Ether, and they get kicked out of the validation pool. So how do validators get chosen? Well, that's part of the job of the beacon chain. And it uses a randomness engine called Randall VDF, as far as I understand it. And um, Randall VDF, or Verifiable Delay Function, is a system that produces a random number generator through consensus. This random number generator is used to select validators from the pool of validators and give them the opportunity to validate a block. So validators stake into a contract, they put down their 32 Ether or more of stake, and then they wait until they are called to validate by the selection of a random number that identifies them as a chosen validator, and then they validate the block that they are handed. If they validate it correctly, they can earn a small reward. There are some other nuances and details. That's what the Beacon Chain does. The Beacon Chain was launched on August 4th and is currently operating as a testnet. Um, it had been in testing for almost two years. Um, and now it is running with validators staking testnet Ether. This phase, called phase zero, is intended to last between one and two years. At the end of this starts phase one. And phase one is the transition of um, the, is the introduction of shards and the transition of the uh, system from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and then phase 1.5 is the incorporation of the existing ETH1 chain into the ETH2 chain. And this is done as a state copy, meaning that Whatever balances, smart contracts, addresses, and things you owned on the ETH1 chain uh, thereafter become available on the ETH2 chain, and the users don't have to change anything. The entire ETH1 chain runs as one of the 64 shards, and this allows for scaling of a factor of up to uh, 64x. All of the shards then get coordinated into the beacon chain, at specified intervals. Uh, I believe those are called epochs. So that's the plan. Uh, Ethereum is moving to proof of stake and a sharded scalable architecture. And the intention was, instead of trying to make incremental disruptive changes to the base Ethereum chain, instead it's, it was implemented as a clean slate implementation, which at some point has a migration of state so that it subsumes the entire ETH1 chain in a way that users don't even notice and all of their data, state, and funds are carried forward to the ETH2 chain. This allowed for much more radical experimentation and rewriting of code from scratch in order to implement these rather ambitious goals. So it's running right now. Um, don't know how long it's going to run. That depends on how well it runs. In the first couple of days, there was a bit of a shortage of validators, but I believe that's been fixed now. I'm watching it with great interest. I'm not currently running a validation node. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to keep it up and running and uh, monitor it carefully, because as I mentioned before, if it goes down, you lose money. Uh, even for testnet ether, I'm not willing to um, do that because I really don't have the time. But uh, I am watching this rather carefully and with great interest because if this implementation is successful, it represents a very significant advancement in the science of consensus algorithms uh, and in the science of proof of stake. Interestingly, there's another uh, question that came up related to this, which might be a good segue from this down the rabbit hole. So that was my uh, question of the day. I hope you enjoyed it.
All right, let's see what else we're going to cover here. Um, here's another great question. When Ethereum finally moves to proof of stake, there will be a lot of miners looking for a new place to direct their proof of work power. Where do you think they'll go? This is a great question asked by Pathfinder. Thank you, Pathfinder. Um, this is a great question because not a lot of people are thinking about the impact of uh, the departure of Ethereum uh, from proof of work will have on the existing miners. Now, uh, one thing I can tell you about the answer to this is not Bitcoin. And the reason not Bitcoin is because Ethereum is mined on GPUs. Um, it has proven to be marginally ASIC resistant by um, by this time, and um, there are no good uh, widely deployed ASICs, as far as I know, for mining Ethereum. And, and because it was always known that it was going to make this transition, miners were not willing to invest the money into building ASICs for Ethereum. And in any case, the algorithm is fundamentally different. Ethereum proof-of-work mining happens with a SHA-3 algorithm, which is different from SHA-256 which is the algorithm used in Bitcoin. So if you take your GPU from mining Ethereum and you try to mine Bitcoin, you will fail because GPU mining in Bitcoin hasn't been profitable since 2013. It is impossible to compete on that basis. And as a result, that's not where these GPU miners are going to go. So where will they go? Um, in order to answer this question, I tried to do um, a bit of research, and then I discovered something really interesting. Here was my train of thought. Look at the market capitalization tables of the top, say, 20 um, blockchains or tokens, and try to figure out which, one of the, which ones are proof of work um, that are not Bitcoin forks and therefore not SHA-256 proof of work, but are another algorithm, and then figure out which ones would be the most profitable to mine. Effectively, that's the decision process that uh, a GPU miner would follow. They would, um, they would decide to go for the most profitable GPU mineable proof of work coin that's next in market capitalization, liquidity, stability, etc., and mining profitability after Ethereum goes away. And if Ethereum goes away by going to proof of stake, that's a pretty big amount of proof of work power that needs to be redirected. Turns out, if you search all of the various market capitalization um, tables that show all of the coins, you can't filter by consensus algorithm, at least not the ones I looked at. So um, I had to kind of go through and from memory, like, oh yeah, no, that's that one's proof of stake. That one's an ERC-20 token. Um, that one's a federated architecture. That's managed by one dude and his dog, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and go through the consensus algorithms. Um, and um, I, I wasn't able to come to a clearer conclusion. It seems to me that uh, some of the top likely candidates right after um, Ethereum are um, Ethereum Classic, of course, as well as Monero, um, Zcash, uh, and perhaps another, uh, another few coins like that, and Litecoin. So the best answer I could get, and this is by no means uh, a correct answer because there, I may have missed many things, are Litecoin, Monero, Zcash, and Ethereum Classic are likely destinations for this extra mining power, which will increase the underlying security of all of these systems by bringing them a lot more hash rate um, from Ethereum. And uh, that's what we had for that question. Anonymous asks, uh, do you see Ethereum 2.0 scaling efforts as a success? Um, can't possibly make that determination at the moment. It's way, way too early. Right now, the, the stuff that's been done in Ethereum 2.0, as I mentioned in my previous answer regarding the phases of deployment of ETH2, um, are not focused on scaling. Scaling happens later with the deployment of the shards. Um, right now, the focus is on the transition from proof of work to a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake, and then to pure proof of stake 
um, using the beacon chain. Uh, that's what's being tested first. The actual scaling solution, which is sharding, happens later. All right, fine. Let me put on my asbestos suit and dive right into this little dumpster fire. Is there a possibility for Bitcoin to scale on the Ethereum blockchain? If yes, how would that look in reality? You know, for every Bitcoin maximalist who goes, Ethereum can't do what Bitcoin does and its monetary policy is garbage, there's an Ethereum maximalist who goes, we can just simulate Bitcoin as an ERC-20 token and all your bases are belong to us. I think both are wrong um, for pretty much the same reasons. And that is that there are real, tangible, underlying trade-offs. That means that when you design for one thing, you necessarily have to de-optimize something else. You don't get to do jack of all trades. You don't go through door number one and door number two as a super quantum, um, superposition of both doors and then come out the other side and say, ta-da! Instead, you have to choose a path, especially in engineering. And that path will involve optimizing for the thing that you think is important. And by necessity, when you optimize for that thing, you make choices. And those choices by necessity make you de-optimize for the other thing. Yes, you can capture Bitcoin and uh, tokenize it and put it as a wrapped token on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, is that as good as Bitcoin? No, it isn't. And the reason it's not as good as Bitcoin is because the fundamental um, mechanism for security in Bitcoin uh, is very, very different. And that very, very different model is designed to be censorship resistant um, and ironically has better privacy um, when used on its native blockchain than Ethereum. So I don't think it's the same. Um, I don't trust a Turing complete smart contract with wrapped Bitcoin with my Bitcoin um, when I can instead put it on a Turing incomplete simple scripting language that has withstood the test of time and cannot so easily be attacked. There are multiple risks in Ethereum smart contracts that um, require many, 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 many iterations before all of the vulnerabilities are found. Risks both within the smart contract implementation, risks in the uh, uh, programming language that is used to implement the smart contract, and risks in the virtual machine that is used to run that smart contract, um, the Ethereum virtual machine, and vulnerabilities in underlying mechanisms such as gas, uh, and the consensus algorithm, all of which are made more complicated by the transition to ETH2. Ethereum is not meant to be the robust, secure, unstealable, uncensorable money platform. It was never meant to be that, no matter how much um, Ethereum fans want it to be that. And it shouldn't be that, because with that comes extremely conservative development that kind of messes up all of the good things in Ethereum. Bitcoin was never meant to be the super flexible smart contract platform. And it shouldn't be either because with that come all kinds of problems that Bitcoin doesn't need. Um, so is there a possibility for Bitcoin to scale on the Ethereum blockchain? Not really. Not without some fundamental sacrifices. Sacrifices that the Bitcoin developers, the Bitcoin culture, the Bitcoin ethos has made very clear it's not willing to make. We, the community who are involved in Bitcoin, are not willing to make the sacrifices to achieve scale by sacrificing decentralization and security. I think we figured that out during the scaling debate. Um, but in any case, if you weren't clear, I think um, that's a resounding no. Does that mean that they can't work together? No, because in fact, there are lots of opportunities where if you want to, you can actually sacrifice a bit of the security by moving your Bitcoin into a wrapped smart contract on Ethereum and then getting advantage of the smart contracts. But be very clear, when you do that, you get the flexibility of the smart contracts. 
by sacrificing the security of the blockchain. And that's a trade-off that I'm very happy to make on occasion. It serves my application use cases very, very well. I can do very interesting things. Um, that's not a huddle application though. And I wouldn't do it for even a tiny minority of my Bitcoin um, because I keep it for a different purpose. I hope that answers your question. Let's see what else do we have. Here we go. Sachin asks, for developers, which one do you think is better to start with, Bitcoin or Ethereum? And what are the possibilities for development in the future? Um, it depends. It depends very much on what you're trying to develop. If you're just trying to be a blockchain developer, then clearly the answer is Ethereum. Not because I say so, because the market has been saying so consistently for the past four years. And you can see that simply by the number of uh, developers who are jumping into Ethereum. Think about the value proposition. You can create banking software with the ease of JavaScript. Now, some developers find that a very appealing value proposition. Oh my God, you can create banking projects with the ease of JavaScript. How brilliant. And a whole bunch of cynical conservatives hear that and go, you can create banking projects on JavaScript? Are you nuts? And right there lies the cultural divide between Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are benefits to both, of course. And if you're trying to learn fast, break things and play around, uh, forge a new future, carve new ground, develop innovative things, and are willing to take very, very big risks at the same time, then the answer is obviously Ethereum. And if what you want to do is develop very conservative, robust financial products, um, especially ones related to the pure function of money, either as a medium of exchange, a store of value, or some combination thereof, then the answer is probably Bitcoin. And your style of programming, your goals, will determine how you do this. Now, moving to Bitcoin development doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be doing core protocol development. That is a high expertise, high learning curve area where it's very unlikely that you're going to get even the slightest pull request or patch introduced into uh, Bitcoin software for at least a couple of years. Um, but I have good news for you. If you want to have much more fast development with a lot more flexibility and freedom, you can also get that in Bitcoin by working on Lightning software. And that's because in Lightning, you don't have to be in lockstep with consensus in every line of code you do, and um, the bugs only affect your implementation of one channel with your channel partner rather than the entire Lightning network and the health of the underlying system. So, it depends. But when you ask the question Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever else, also add Lightning into that equation because there is kind of an in-between that is a very interesting domain with a lot of uh, really talented developers doing very interesting work. My answer in the end was both. Um, and it was precisely for the same reason that I speak multiple languages and travel to multiple countries, because I believe that gaining perspective by exploring many different cultures, many different styles, uh, many different lifestyles, many different environments, you learn not only about these new places, but it teaches you very valuable lessons about the old places, the places you came from. It's only in seeing the differences that you fully appreciate um, the original. And uh, in fact, I've learned that through language. When you learn a second language, you understand the first one better. Uh, through programming languages, through cuisines, through international travel, through exposure to different cultures. And it shouldn't be a surprise to you by this point that I am not a maximalist in any aspect of my life. Um, and I don't believe in litmus tests and dogma. So as a programmer, I would have the same attitude, which is 
intellectual curiosity above everything else, a willingness to play, a willingness to explore, and a willingness to compare things in order to better understand both sides of the equation. So if you're a developer, try both. What else? What else? What else? Okay, fine. I'll do a completely self-serving one. Paul says, peace and love, brother. I don't understand Ethereum at all. What book would you recommend? Hmm. Oh, I know. Mastering Ethereum, written by Andreas M. Antonopoulos and Dr. Gavin Wood. Um, it's not only for sale on Amazon, hint, hint. Oh, come on. I'm not going to try and sell you on a book. Um, you can download it for free on GitHub, read it, and enjoy it under a Creative Commons license. Recently, actually, I made it available as an open edition ebook on my website where you can not only um, buy it, but you get a DRM free PDF, EPUB, and Mobi in multiple formats uh, that is truly yours to enjoy forever without um, the licensing restrictions. But I've got a question for you, Paul. What languages do you speak? Because the best gift we can all give back to the community is to help me on my mission. My mission is to educate as many people as possible in as many languages as possible about open blockchains, and that includes Ethereum. My book, Mastering Ethereum, has now been on TransEffex for just over seven months. TransEffex is a translation platform where volunteers are already hard at work. The Spanish translation is almost done. So congratulations for all of those who are working hard on the Spanish translation. And for all of you who speak another language that is not Spanish, you need to work harder, my friends, because the Spaniards are beating you and they're going to get Mastering Ethereum translated and available as a Spanish ebook very, very soon. So if you speak a language um, that is not English, that perhaps doesn't have a lot of English speakers in your country, and you would like to see a book like Mastering Ethereum, same applies for Mastering Bitcoin, and you would like to see it in your own language, and you would like to learn about these technologies, there is no better way to learn about one of these technologies than to read the entire book while trying to translate it into your native or second language and give back to the community through that. So shameless promotion of my book, but not to buy it. Um, instead, to become one of my co-authors, to contribute in building an educational foundation um, that will serve for many years to come. That's my mission. And that mission is supported by all of you who have been so kind to come on this live stream and ask me great questions. So first of all, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for asking great questions about Ethereum basics. Um, I really appreciate all of your patience um, and willing to, your willingness to tackle this topic at a time when there is a bit of acrimony um, and some raging battles on Twitter. I'd like to especially thank those of you who have decided to join me with a YouTube membership. You don't get much in return. All you get is silly emojis. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to ask you to demonstrate these silly emojis in the chat right now with an emoji storm. Go. All right, and while you're all watching the emoji storm that our YouTube members are demonstrating in the chat, and can appreciate the pure silliness and pointlessness of it all. I'd like to thank uh, those of you who support me on uh, Patreon and make it possible for me to do this work. And I'm going to bore you with another pitch. So I'd like to um, express this in the words of the people who actually support me on Patreon. Back last year, when touching other human beings was still possible, I did a series of uh, visits to various countries in Europe, as well as South America. And during this tour, I met with many of my community builders on Patreon. 
at an event we call a happy hour. This involved a lot of beer, a lot of laughing, a lot of jostling around, a lot of wearing of weird and funny t-shirts with dank memes. And um, I got to know many of you. And during that, I asked some of you if you wanted to do a quick video to tell other people why you might support me as a community builder. So let's watch it in the words of those people who do support me, who I thank so much. I am a patron of Andreas because I came across his videos online and that's how I learned about Bitcoin. So that's how I got introduced to Bitcoin. I'm out tonight um, at a social event organized by Andreas as part of his uh, Patreon support. Um, we just uh, had a few drinks in a pub, uh, which is a punch tavern uh, downtown London. So it's been a really fun evening uh, to meet a lot of my mind. We should support the work Andreas is doing. He's doing so much in getting new people into Bitcoin and into Bitcoin education. He's a great teacher. He can explain very complex topics in an easy to understand way. He's very honest, very precise, technically prepared and intellectually honest. I think it's uh, his best characteristic. Bring such clarity to uh, really complex subjects, uh, which is Bitcoin and um, it has been a very, very good inspiration for me. And every Bitcoin I'm giving to him, it will be very well used in helping others understand Bitcoin. And I think it will improve the world at some point. Being a patron, I get to meet Andreas. And that's why, why I love being a patron. I'm going to continue being a patron. I think it's just a good thing. If you're interested in learning new things and also want to support the, the Bitcoin community, then you got to be a patron. Being a Patreon makes you feel special. You can uh, attend to his uh, live Q&A sessions. You can meet him at happy hours. It's really great, totally worth it. I'm very, very enthusiastic of being a Patreon. I'd like him to be able to produce his great and valuable content in the future, free from advertising and just with the help of his Patreons, and that's why I'm supporting him on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free, so if you want to support it, join me on Patreon. I love that little tune. Uh, that music is from Orphan, who you can find on Facebook, facebook.com slash Orphan. And you can find uh, my attribution for uh, that great music, which I'm sure you all recognize immediately, at the bottom of every one of my uh, YouTube video descriptions. So thank you, Orphan, for um, contributing that wonderful music. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, live stream. But uh, we have another fantastic bonus live stream Q&A next week. Uh, next week, we're talking about decentralized exchanges or DEXs. Uh, decentralized exchanges are a great topic. They're an incredibly empowering technology that truly brings forward the real benefits of decentralization and building this new economy. Um, they're a very important part of keeping these systems resilient, open, and free. And uh, so I'm very interested in what questions you'll have for our bonus live stream on decentralized exchanges. For those of you who are um, subscribers on Patreon, the Q&A is open now. Uh, you already have the code. You can go and access it. Um, YouTube members will get it uh, 30 to 60 minutes before we start the live stream. And then everybody else can jump on and ask questions live. Uh, come and join me next Saturday, same time, uh, same place for the Decentralized Exchanges bonus live stream Q&A. And don't forget, we publish a whole bunch of videos all the time. A lot of Q&A videos that continuously get published on this channel. And you can get the latest by subscribing on the channel. So don't forget to subscribe. Um, hit the little bell icon to get notifications when new videos or posts are made. You'll get advance notice of a bunch of different things we do. And um, also, please share, like, comment, enjoy, subscribe. All right, thank you so much for coming today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you about this very interesting topic. Um, and I really appreciate you taking your time out of your weekends to join me. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care.